Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Wander and Muse. This is the podcast for creatives, puts a spotlight on them so they can explain what they've been up to that's making the world a better place. Today's guest, I'm very excited for you all to get to know Leslie Clark, also known as Nomad Gal, and you can head over to nomadgal.com to take a look at some of her artwork and her uh, organization called the nomadfoundation.org to learn more about that. So let's go ahead and get talking. First off, I think it's so interesting that your whole journey started with your Master of Fine Arts from George Washington University. And then it went on from there. So I love how you go from Washington, D.C. to Africa. So you go ahead and run with your story because I love it. Well, it was a rather circuitous route to get to finally to Africa. But I decided when I first started traveling, I was working on my master's at, at George Washington. And I didn't have to attend classes in the last year of my master's. So I decided I'd move to the south of France because I thought all these artists that I really admired had lived there. And right. um, so I thought, what a great place to just paint. I had to paint and write my thesis. So I was painting on plein air all around the hill villages in Provence. And I was living in Cap d'Ai, just outside of Monaco. And um, I was painting in saint paul de Vence, I think it was. And someone walked up to me and looked at my paintings, and he offered me a show in Monaco. Wow. And so I just, it was my first show. I was just a student. I just jumped at the chance. And um, the show went, came off pretty well, and I sold a number of paintings, and I thought, well, you know, this is a good gig. So what it sure I, is. Wow, how fortunate <laughs> for you. What I wow. to start doing is to take a trip, paint, and I've always been interested in painting people and making mm -hmm. a people connection and kind of telling their story, not, not just in portraits, but as just doing what they do. So I would travel, paint a series of paintings, and figure out how to sell them so I could earn enough money for the next trip. I love that. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that went on and on and on until I finally um, got an interest in indigenous people, and uh -huh. that happened in Guatemala. But I won't go into that long story. I'll just tell you that it led me. I was to be, uh, go to uh, Palenque, where the Mayan ruin, mm -hmm. and I uh, was supposed to have a, a show there of the work that I've been doing, um, the paintings of Guatemala and southern Mexico. And then there was this Zapatista uprising, so I couldn't go back. And I had, it's too dangerous, and they canceled the conference. And so I um, had the money saved up and the time set aside. And so I thought, well, where would I find these indigenous people? Mm -hmm. Decided it had to be West Africa. Oh, so that's fantastic. Yeah, so I so I booked a trip, and my first one was a low budget, kind of catastrophic trip. But you know, <laughs> all of all of travel in Africa is kind of half catas catastrophe and <laughs> just wondrous. So, right, right. So that first trip, I was caught in a tribal war. I had a bow and arrow painted right, uh, pointed right at my nose. Oh my goodness! I was looking cross-eyed at that thing, and I went into slow motion and thinking, you know, I'd rather be shot by that shot by that <laughs> machine gun over there than that arrow. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and then I got later escaped that. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, I decided to book the best hotel in town because I'd been camping and roughing it for weeks. Uh -huh. So I decided, you know, this is a great, you know, safe place to be. And I was, but what I didn't think about was that all the wealthiest people would be live, would be staying in the nicest hotel in town. And, right. Uh, so I was walking along the beach with my backpack on and I got mugged. Oh, and no. then, <laughs> And they stole my, I had all of my really valuable stuff. I had my money belt around my waist. Right. But my backpack contained only my sketchbook from the entire first trip to Africa. Oh, my goodness. All of my beautiful watercolor, uh, oh. my sable brushes, and my oh. journal. And 
they stole that. And of course, it was totally useless to them. Right. Right. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. What so, a shame. Yeah, it was kind of. But I, it also, it, I have a pretty good memory of when I, when I sketch something, I'm, I really remember it. Okay. And it can, it can be a terrible sketch, but I can still visualize everything about that moment from my, my stupid sketch. And so I just went and bought this, all I could get, there were no art supplies in Dakar in Senegal. And so I just got this little grid lined school kids notebook and a, in a pencil and uh-huh. just recreated my journal. And I love I, that. Wow. You recreated the whole journal. That's yeah. amazing. And so do you prefer to ha- make your paintings from these watercolors and sketches or, or more from the drawing or photographs? Like what do you prefer? It's, it's really a combination mm-hmm. of everything. Sometimes I'm in a situation where I just do not have time to do a sketch. And so uh-huh. I do. A photograph. Okay. I almost always have uh, I, 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 I'm drawing constantly when I'm traveling. So I have sketches of most everything and I usually try to take a photograph too, but I find that if I do a sketch, I focus on something that is really interesting to me and a right. photograph will focus on everything. It's not, it doesn't remind me of why I really wanted to paint that thing. Exactly. When you're doing a sketch, you're already doing the cropping as you're right. sketching. You know, a photograph, you know that what you want to capture, but that you might need to crop later, that sort of thing. So you're absolutely right how you're really focusing on the subject matter that really speaks to you. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that. And so tell me more. I know that when you first reached out to me, you were talking about how because of all these adventures you've had, and I want to hear more about your adventures. But you said that all of this is coming together in a book. So let's definitely talk about that book that you've been working on. Well, um, COVID shut down my travels. Right. And I have a trunk full of journals mm-hmm. that all of my experiences and sketches and I just decided to go back and recreate, you know, this. I actually ended up focusing on one country that captured my heart, and uh-huh. that was Niger. Okay. I, I didn't get to Niger till 94. That was a year after my first trip to Africa. Okay. Um, but I found, I was, I, after the first trip, I was so excited about Africa, it, partly because of that intensity of the extremes of experience. You know, mm-hmm. you're mugged one day and you <laughs> see the most beautiful tribal festival that you can imagine with masks and beautiful right, dance. Right, the next day. So mm-hmm. I, I really wanted more of it. So I came home and researched like crazy. I read, got a hold of every book I could read on Africa, especially West Africa and the Sahara Desert I was okay. very interested in. Mm-hmm. I came a book called Nomads of I came across a book called Nomads of Niger by by Carol Beckwith and I d- was determined to go see these Wadabi who were the have this phenomenal festival where it's a beauty contest and makeup and the women judge it. I love that. The Sadie <laughs> Hawkins of <laughs> tribal This is a culture I've got to visit. Yes. So I um, I tracked down an agency that had gone to Niger but wasn't able to because there was a rebellion going on. So mm-hmm. she said, and she knew Carol Beckwith. And I oh. thought, well, that's a very good connection. She said, but if you're interested in tribal people, come with me to Ethiopia. And so I did. Mm-hmm. And and that experience was, was wonderful, but I, I really felt... Uh, like I was still just an observer. I was mm. looking at it from the outside, and mm-hmm. I have I I had I I didn't have time to develop any kind of connection. Uh, Irma Turtle was this woman's name that I traveled with, and she said, "I'm not. I can't do this officially as a travel agent, but I will. Uh, I would love to have company. I'm going to Niger after Ethiopia. Oh. Come with." Me. Perfect. So I jumped at that chance. Uh-huh. And, um, so I went with her and 
we, you know, hopscotched uh, going from West Africa, East Africa to West Africa is very difficult. It even is today. But mm -hmm. And it was, you know, six stops. But I, I get get off the plane into this dense heat of the Sahel, of uh, which is the the border of the Sahara Desert, and uh, and just we get in this vehicle and we drive for twelve hours, Oof. and we finally get into uh, nomad territory. Getting in the getting. Getting your act together to get out of the town is really challenging because you have to take everything that you're going to need. You right. can't you can't buy anything out of outside of the main town, and there mm -hmm. are hardly roads in the country, anyways. Anyway, we get to this point, and the military stop us after our twelve hours of driving, and Oof. they stop us and say, "You can't go any farther because the Tuareg rebellion is going on there, so, uh, and they're shooting at us, and they will shoot at you. So you better turn around." So we turned around. Oh and, my goodness! After twelve hours and all that right. travel, wow! And so by the, the, this, that time, it's the next day, and we're and we're driving along, and the the driver Garba says, "Oh, that's a Wadabi camp." So Irma and I both shout out, "Stop! Stop!" Uh huh. So we we get we stop at this camp, and it's just these little domed structures. They're portable structures. They're large, like tent like things. Okay. And um, and the women come out chattering, and they lay mats all over the ground, and and sweep the ground for us, and and welcome us, and we don't have a clue what they're saying, right? And but we're laughing, and I'm so excited to be with the Wadabi finally. Huh? And then this guy comes walking up in this billowing cobalt blue robe and a impeccably white turban and and Irma nudges me and says here comes Mr. Handsome right and he is just everybody goes silent and I and um and he's smiling he has this just charming sparkling smile huh? so um I fall in love immediately <laughs> wow it turns out that he's married to all four of the women that are with us oh could he use a so, fifth or sixth wife <laughs> <laughs> well you're supposed to stop at you're supposed to stop at four but he did <laughs> after after being with him for two weeks he did ask me to marry him which I was I was very tempted but it I did have a partner at home, so. but oh that goodness. relationship developed, and I went back the next year, and for the next 30 years, and that family became my family, wow. and he named his first grandchild after me. Wow, what an honor. I just got, I, I didn't know how to talk to them, so I made my own dictionary. I'd sit under the tree while I was doing my sketches and then make, you know, a dictionary. So I'd point at things and ask what it meant, and I eventually got so that I could communicate with them. And then, you know, a year later, I went back and I migrated with them on a camel on their annual migration. I and, love this story. Yeah, so <laughs> they were they just became very, very close. I was back about three years ago, and the little girl who was born the first trip is now married and has a child of her own. Wow. Yeah. They, so, you've really gotten to know them. What a cool thing. And yeah. then what have they learned about your culture? Um, well, you know, it, it's very interesting. I try to describe it. They don't have television or anything. Right. They're beginning now to have uh, connections by by phone, uh, WhatsApp. They mm, can, mm -hmm. you know, have some certain, but there's really poor cell service and very little internet there. So they right. really are still pretty isolated and very traditional. And, mm -hmm. you know, I describe that I live in a house and, and, and they felt sorry for me because I couldn't see the stars at night. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's true. It's true. It's like totally different perspectives on what yeah. is valued. Yeah. And and I was stuck in one spot. Right. They had to move wherever they wanted, you know. Right. Exactly. So that that's half of my life in, well, no, that's half of the... A piece of the pie. <laughs> that's a piece of the pie. 
Um, and then the next year I went back and I was able to go into the north where the Tuareg rebellion had been going on because I wanted to meet the Tuareg also because okay. the Wadabi are have this fabulous festival and they're cattle herders, but nomadic. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the Tuareg live deeper into the Sahara Desert and they are camel herders. Oh. And a caravan, they take the salt caravans across the desert. They've hmm. dominated the Sahara Desert for, you know, millennia. Mm-hmm. And so I was really anxious to meet them. And I also wanted to see the desert. Well, I was able to go into the north and and with Irma and I was helping her lead a group of tourists. And we're out, we're out in this oasis and we see this cloud of dust approaching, roaring toward us. And you're in a place where nobody else is there. You right. don't there's no traffic. There are no roads. You're There's in the no middle rush of, hour. <laughs> exactly. You're in the middle of nowhere. And so this cloud of dust comes roar and and emerging from the cloud of dust are these 50 caliber machine guns from the top of the trucks. Oof. And I'm going, what's going to happen? You know, and I was I was very very nervous and so the truck screeched to a stop right in front of us. And this guy, this very handsome turbaned guy walks out smiling and he comes over and, and says hi to Irma. Oh, thank they goodness. Knew each other. So oh. this guy is the rebel leader and he had started the main tourist agency in Niger. Oh. And when the rebellion started, because the, they were being marginalized by their government, he went into the desert to lead the rebels because he was he had an education he had a business experience and he had um the ability to be a leader he he was very uh, very isolated out there in the desert all of his assets and he had cars and buildings and you know agency things uh they were all seized so he was there with his rebels just fighting the the good fight and wow. he's do you know they're we're fighting for the survival of our culture. Oh, wow. And so uh, Irma was going to leave and the tourists were going to go back. And he said, well, would you like to come back and travel with me uh, and I'll show you the desert? Of course, I jumped at this. <laughs> I jump at every opportunity. Just, we are cut from the same mold. I'm the same way. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Let's see what not? happens. It's just a group of armed, turbaned <laughs> rebel guys. <laughs> but their smiles are fantastic. So, they... <laughs> yeah, yes. So oh I, I, um, if I get back out to. It was very hard to leave the town because they were blocking people because they didn't want aid to be sent to the rebels. Mm-hmm. And finally, he manages to sneak sneak me out, uh, and he introduces me. To the Sahara Desert, the dunes, the Grand Erg, the most magnificent wow. part. It became my sacred place. I fell in love again mm-hmm. with the desert. Right. So that that has become just anytime I can get back there, it's such a a precious, it's such a spiritual place. Mm-hmm. And I um Totally loved it, and I we traveled for three weeks with the with the rebels, and there's a whole bunch of stories attached there, but I won't go into them because we don't have that much time. <laughs> but uh, these are in your book. You. Are the stories uh, in your they book? They are in the book. <gasps> and let me tell you that I before I left, he said, you know, I really there. This was before the internet, before sat phones, anything. They had mm-hmm. no communications. He said. Tell our story to the world. Uh, wow. And, uh, you know, I don't know how. I really don't know how. Mm-hmm. Well, that I spent the next 30 years of my life fulfilling my promise to him. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So now will the book include either photographs and or illustrations or paintings that depict what you saw? Uh, I hope so. Um, I'm still looking for a publisher, so that kind of is their decision. But the I have oh, not only you know I have an I have a sketch or a photograph or or a painting of virtually everything that's in the book. Wow. I have a ton of film uh, footage that I was doing a film for National Ge- Geographic that they kind of. Uh, 
we did all the f- the the uh, filming, and then they decided not to produce it. So I ended up owning the footage. So I've got all of this fabulous footage. Wow, that is from ninety seven uh, of their festivals and of the Touareg. Uh, and, um, anyway, I, I also saw in the notes that in two thousand five you did a different filming with the National Geographic. Correct? There were two different years that you were with National Geographic. Actually, there were three. The okay. first one was a film on my own. I had opened a gallery in Ojai, California, mm-hmm. and the guy walks in to the gallery and he looks at my paintings of the Wadabi and he starts making the faces that they make in their beauty contest. And I said, you have been there. Oh. And he said, yes, I made the National Geographic film with Carol Beckwith that inspired oh. you to go. That's in amazing. The wow. And he wanted to go back. So we planned this and <laughs> And National Geographic accepted it. And then they, at the last minute, pulled the plug because of a change in management. So I ended up with the footage. But it was a, it was a really amazing experience. It was just he and I and, you know, the, the mats. Right. I feel like both of these instances definitely sound like blessings in disguise. The fact that you yes. are the owner of all this amazing footage. That's brilliant. That's, yes. I mean, perhaps... This needs to be a documentary more than a book. Well, I want it to be a book, a coffee table book, mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. documentary, and maybe a mini series because there, you go. there are so many stories. And right. I I started when I finished the first version of my book, it was like 250,000 words, and I cut it down to 90,000 because I was wow. talking. It's just way too long. And so I... Uh, uh, there's just many, st- many stories to tell. I and love I- that. If you had to choose a current day actress, who would you want to play yourself? Ooh. <laughs> well, I've thought a lot about it. You know, I didn't go to Niger for the first time until I, and, uh, I was 45. Okay. So I wasn't, I wasn't a young whippersnapper. Right, right. <laughs> I went. Oh, it could. There are two actresses come to mind just because of their Africa connections. Mm. Um, one is uh, Angelina Jolie because she's yes. adopted all these kids from Africa, she and has. she's about the right age. She's awfully. She's prettier than I am, but you know that doesn't matter. But you've only seen her with proper lighting and all that, so you. <laughs> And the other who happens to live on the same or have just has just built a house on the same street that I live in Ojai is Charlize Theron. She's cool. Yeah. She's cool. So anyway, those are. Oh, I you love know, it. That's fun my, to dream, huh? Big, but I love that you're aiming high. Why not? Of course. Why not? Why not? <laughs> That's fantastic. So we've talked a little bit about your your nomadgal.com website and where people can find your artwork, your other entrepreneurial and philanthropy endeavors, you know, the Nomad Gallery and Oh Hi, that sort of thing. What else do you want people to know about, either about the book coming up and how you want a publisher or just about even, gosh, well, first answer that question, then I have a couple more questions. <laughs> well, the the second half of my life in Niger turned from being an artist, painting what I saw, selling my work, opening mm-hmm. an art alley, all that, to being a humanitarian. Right. Because I bought a cow for Pierogi. Pierogi, the, the handsome guy that I met on my first trip, because they uh-huh. had been so generous to me and that he would leave his family and take me to to the festival, show me where to go because they are not announced uh, in in advance. You you have to have a wadabi with you to find them. Okay. And I would I would lead tourists in, and I he they had the family had just been so good to me, so I bought him a cow. When I went back, it cost me two hundred dollars, which was okay. a lot of money for me at the time, but it didn't change my life. Right. It, you could do without it, but no, yeah. it would make an impact for them. It did change their lives. Mm-hmm. So when I went back the next year, his uncle said, you know, that cow allowed him to remain nomadic instead of having to go into a city and beg and lose right. all his skills. And so I thought, wow, if that, you know, I can't help a lot of people with my limited uh, um, 
income, my limited finances, but um, I need to start asking for help. Mm-hmm. So I ended up at, through many little steps, uh, started a, a nonprofit organization, and um, it has been going since 97. We uh, started out, you have to kind of focus on everything with the nomads because they they need, you know, they need uh, clean water. They need water at all. They need, um, they need education. They need health care, all these things. But all of them are very delicate dances to do the right thing. And what I discovered the longer I worked with them is to let them make the choices. Okay. I'll assist them at in those choices but they are really smarter than I am at what they need. Right. I can make what they need happen better than they can. But um, so we we built a center for nomadic life that has a boarding school and uh, education center for adults and a medical clinic. And the medical clinic has now, we've put a woman, a local woman through Tuareg woman through a midwife school, and we've trained 80 traditional birth attendants. And they are bringing the only health care to an area the size of West Virginia. Wow. That's so, wow, that's so important. And especially with birth, because I'm sure the statistics for their birth, the health of the baby and the mother has increased just well, substantially. They had, the, they had the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. Oh, in the world. Wow. And they also were rated the worst place to be a mother and child by the um, by uh, the Save the Children. So it, it it was it's a struggle. But these women, what we found out is I lost the thing that prompted this is I lost five young friends in one year in childbirth, and they it wasn't always their first ch- uh, child. Huh. They were leaving orphans, and we just had to figure this out. And I am not a a health, I have no experience in healthcare, Mm -hmm. but I met a retired physician who was just dying to help, and we devised a program, and we found out on his first trip training these women uh, that the primary cause for them was dehydration. Wow, okay, right. Think of living in the Sahara Desert, it's so hard to get water, and you're really... It's difficult on the, it's hard on the whole community if you sure. drink water, but they, when they found that that was the case, they want to protect the pregnant women and sure. so just make sure that, that, you know, she gets wow. one, one bit of water for the, for herself and one for the baby. And that's really turned things around. I love that. And I saw on your nomadfoundation.org, some of the programs such as sponsor a student for a year, um, uh, Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's very difficult to, uh, I was, our foundation was responsible for building and supporting 18 different schools. But at some point, the schools would fall apart because these are populations that make their living through mobile pastoralism. So they have to move wherever there's pasture for their herds. Oh, and if I there's see. a drought around where the school building is, it's you're they're they're gonna go away. Oh, I see. So okay. All the schools would shut down. So we figured the only way to be able to do this is to have a boarding school. And so we built this, what we call the Center for Nomadic Life. It's on their migration route, so it's accessible easily because they know the territory. They're passing by there annually, always, so everybody, all the nomads know where it is. And uh, we said, okay, this school is open to all nomads, um, and we will provide the teacher, the school supplies, the, the food, the medical care, but you have to provide the care of the children. Mm, mm-hmm. And that way we couldn't fail at that. They had to, they know what their kids want. You know, I had a friend who said, oh, I can get beds from Italy. They've never slept in a bed in their lives. Right. They don't want beds. Right. <laughs> okay. right. So we wanted them to be cared for in the way that was acceptable to them. Mm-hmm. So we set that up and it's worked beautifully. And we've had 
Uh, we've got, now have our first uh, uh, girl who's gone into nursing school. She started as a you know a kindergartner in at Thomas Na the school, our boarding school, and now she, we've sent her to a nursing school in in Agadez, which is a city. The school only goes through grammar school, which which gives them a, a very good basis if they can get do you know reading, writing, and sure. arithmetic. But some of them have chosen to go on, and we've got I think. See, there's 11 students that have gone to junior high school, high school, and and now uh, in nursing school. That's fantastic. That must feel so good. Yeah, it does. It does. And all and- from going from getting your MFA and moving on to France and then Africa, and then all this happened. Does do you ever just kind of pinch yourself? Uh, yeah, you know, I think that, well, you were saying that we were cut from the same mold because we jump on every opportunity. I never had a vision of being a humanitarian and doing right. care. I'm not even <laughs> remotely interested in being a doctor or right. want to help people. Sure. Uh, you know, it was just those tiny steps and, st- and taking, jumping on every opportunity that right. led me to the next little step. That's beautiful. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all yeah. about. Just putting each foot in front of the other, not knowing exactly what's around the next bend, but being open to what you're going to see around the next bend, right? Exactly. Just moving forward. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. Such a pleasure to talk to you. I absolutely love your story and I can't wait to see it on the big screen and or on my coffee table. (laughs) Well, I hope it gets there sooner than later. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. Everyone can head over to nomadgal.com. And that's where you can find all the information that Leslie Clark has been working on. And while you're at your computer, go ahead and head over to wanderandmuse.world to take a look at some of my past guests. Everyone has an interesting story to share, and everyone is leaving the world a better place because of the things that they're creating. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Go out and create something today.